Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am excited to see um, so many people interested in this topic. I know that it's uh, kind of the off season when it comes to the the gardening, but this is the time of year when I know most of you um, are starting to wind down gardens but get excited about next year so hopefully this will give you something to ponder through the winter. I have worked for Extension for 20 years. I'm in actually in Unit 2 which is Boone to Calvin Ogle. I focus on environmental uh, issues. I'm on the Energy and Environmental Stewardship Team and uh, am available if you need me uh, and I believe my uh, We'll go to this first slide and double check. Um, oh, and my email's not there, but you can find me at psdoty at illinois.edu if you think of something later, and I'll try to remember to give you that again. So this presentation, I tend to be, um, let me let me set, put it straight, I am not a gardener. My father was an agronomist. Um, yeah, I'm a naturalist, he was the gardener. And this was put together for my friends who are gardeners, for my master gardeners, as a way to help gardeners understand how important they are. To the, to the wildlife world, and we don't always want animals in our gardens. However, you as gardeners play a huge role. Gardening is the number one global hobby, um, though, according to my friend Nancy, it's kind of declining in, in the U.S., which was very um, disturbing to me because we need more gardeners. Um, I don't know um, if you realize it, but you're, you're, if all the gardeners were to quit gardening, a lot of our property wouldn't be in any kind of care. So keep that in mind. So if you plant it, they will come, and this isn't just a field of dreams kind of thing. We're talking about wildlife, and not everybody wants all kinds of wildlife. However, this will also include a little bit of gardening, some science, because that's what I know, some spiritual nature relationships, facts, and maybe a little storytelling. So hopefully you'll enjoy the ride. So birds and people, we have a historical relationship with birds, and it, it's in these points here on the slide. A lot of it is that amazement with flight, um, but we have uh, those things listed here, and especially that ecological importance that we're gonna we're gonna dive into uh, in during this time. So with folklore, we have a lot of things. My father um, and my grandfather were very big into. Uh, planting according to weather and signs, and we have meteorological changes that are obviously have the greatest impact on our flying animals. Uh, sailors, second only to the ground soldiers, were very superstitious and had many bird-related beliefs. Maine, out in Maine, the fishermen would watch the gulls, and probably still do today, and if they flew out to sea in the morning, it would be safe to go to sea, and if the gulls did not fly out, they would stay near shore to fish for fear of, of upcoming you know, inclement weather. And the fall hunt. A lot of people said that if the breastbone of the goose was cloudy, it was going to be a very cold winter. It mild if it was pale and bitter and snowy if it was red. Uh, much of this was through phenology. They would tie in things that they noticed each year, and people kept really strong phenology journals, writing of the weather and the, you know, all the temperature readings and things each day. I had an aunt who kept an entire recipe box, my great aunt Hannah, with every single thing that happened that day wrapped around weather so she could go back and look for changes. So they weren't initially science and research based, but they, a lot of them came to be true and a lot of them were just something that uh, was made up. They believed that um, it was going to rain longer if the chickens stayed out, which makes no sense to me at all, right? So when we also, um, one of the other things we see a lot are low-flying geese. And low-flying geese, which it's firmly found in the principles of barometric pressure, that when there's pressure changes, animals change, and especially our airborne creatures. I don't know if any of you knew um, about the, the Greek mythology in this case, but this, uh, this certain um, myth mythological sun Icarus, he and his father developed wings. They wanted to fly to the sun. His father was the creator of the labyrinth, and they attempted to leave Crete by means of wings made with feathers and wax, right? So there was that. There's also that relationship, and many of you have probably heard of this, and that's that, that delight in, in relationships spiritually. People believe that cardinals are visiting members of friends and family that have passed, and that that's a very strong belief, and many people 
still believe that. And I have um, this picture of my very own, and it was uh, the, the day after my father had passed. And this male cardinal was in my yard feeding that little female cardinal, and he was hopping. Most of our, our young baby birds have to eat insects, and so that's the importance of this, this particular webinar for you to, you know, to get that point that we need insects in our garden. And so to get birds, we're going to plant a lot of things for insects. And he sat and worked so hard to feed her that day and jumping for bugs, and she would wait, and he would turn around, and if she was too far, oh, would she get an earful from him. And then there's just that flat-out beauty and amazement in the variety. Here's a goldfinch on my sunflowers. It, it absolutely is stunning that a bird can look so plain in the winter and, and alter its feather com composition just to attract a mate. This may not get you excited, but part of what we're going to talk about today are ecological importance, right? And that those ecological services that our birds do for us. In this case, if we didn't have vultures, and granted they do migrate, they're migrating out and going south from northern Illinois now, uh, but the money we would have to put out in cleanup crews for roadkill and other situations of animal death would be enormous. And these are one of the few birds that can actually smell. I know you were probably told as a child that if you you touch that baby bird, the parents won't feed it because it'll smell humans. Well, your parents were fib too. I was fib too. You were fib too. Most of our birds, not including the vulture, don't have a developed olfactory lobe, and they don't have a good sense of smell. And a proof of that is the great horned owl. The great horned owl's favorite food is skunk. And if you could smell that, I don't believe you would eat it, right? So your garden's potential, right? So your your garden's potential, could it be more? Could it be more than just for you? How many dispossessed creatures could you serve? All right, dispossessed is simply means derived of homes, uh, possessions, or securities. So by, by doing a garden in a particular way, you could reclaim those things for, for certain animals, including birds. And a gardener's greatest gift is peace. And when you have a garden that's working and working for all the wildlife um, that you're interested in, especially birds, um, if it isn't giving you peace, you need to change something. And if, if it still isn't, you need to stop gardening. I hear a lot of people that garden a lot, and they're like, I can't believe I have to weed again. Well, that's part of the process. That's part of the, the time it is with your garden, that therapy time. Uh, weeding is part of the big picture. And sometimes we fight really hard not to have to weed, but you're missing out on that time directly in contact. Because if you hurry up, go out, do something in the garden, and then go in and have a cup of coffee, you're kind of missing the point of your garden. So here's a little bit more of that pegginess that I throw into things. For those of you who are listening that know me, you won't be surprised. But I love this, and I usually don't read to people, but I'm going to do this one from Eckhart Tolle. We depend on nature not only for the, your, our physical survival, we also need nature to show us the way home, the way out of the prison of our own minds. We got lost in doing, thinking, remembering, anticipating, lost in a maze of complexity and a world of problems. We have forgotten what rocks, plants, and animals still know. We have forgotten how to be, how to be still and to be ourselves and to be where life is here and now. If you let your yard go and do nothing, it will reclaim itself because every rock and every piece of soil knows exactly what it's supposed to be doing but we like to try to make it what we want it to do. And that's not wrong, but there's things we can do to help our environment at the same time that we garden. So getting to the meat, the stuff that you're most interested in, right, that would be your garden. And if you want to garden for the birds, how do you like to use your yard? It's important. And most of you know this. My Hort friends know this, and it's it's not something that is as common to me, right? But... How do you use your yard? Do you have children or grandchildren who want to play? If you plant the whole thing, you're going to be yelling at them all the time to get out of the garden, right? Do you like to entertain in your yard? Do you need space to spread out tables or play bocce ball? Do you appreciate quiet space for yourself? That would be me. If you have pets that go outside, what are their needs? How far do they go? We don't want to make our life complex. We want to make it more compatible. So here's Charlie. He's one of mine, right? Charlie is a silky terrier. He's a hand-me-down. He's a little bit crazy. He's 12 and still acts like he's four. And he needs running space and a place to throw a ball and catch a ball. 
All right. So we need to make sure Charlie has some green mow space uh, wherever he's going to travel in the yard. Here's TJ. So TJ is an African sulcata tortoise. He's a hand-me-down, and we actually um, keep him at the nature center that I work with with a partner um, in DeKalb County. And he's at the nature center during the cold months, but he has access to my yard slash garden all summer. And I have to remember, he's kind of like um, one of those moving vacuum cleaners um, and moves all the time. And it's not that he wants to eat a hosta, but if you take a tortoise that weighs 60 pounds and let him walk across a hosta, the hosta no longer exists. And I don't think that's probably a surprise. He now, by the way, has his own Instagram. Uh, so if you want to follow... TJ underscore the tortoise. Uh, we would love to have you follow along at what's happening in nature from a very short bodied personality and view. So inventory time. What's already growing in your garden? Are there non-natives you could part with now that you could switch to a native plant? And this isn't an all native perspective. Don't, don't get me wrong. Do you have a balance of herbaceous and woody species? We need those woody species for cover right, trees, shrubs, what trees are on your property, do you have a variety of deciduous and evergreens, what is something you have always wanted, and if so, does it come in native? Mine was a red bud, I finally got my red bud, and people said that unless it's, you know, something found close by, it wouldn't be hardy enough, and it was uh, in someone's yard, and they gave it to me, and I finally have my red bud, and it's an attachment to a childhood tree that was in my yard. So looking for birds, now you're looking at your garden, you're thinking about structure, you're not sitting there right this moment, but it's in your mind. Birds seek a habitat. If you want to draw birds to your yard, they have needs. And when those needs are met, they stay. And when, and most importantly, when they stay, if their needs are met, they can reproduce. And that's what we're after, is to give back a little something, right, as well as get to enjoy them. So food, shelter, water, space, it's the same for everyone. All right, so they have those same needs, and those needs are listed, and they, you, I believe you got uh, those handouts as well, so we won't read everything. There's your goal. Your goal is reproduction. To have those babies born in your yard says you, you have a garden that's high enough quality that those animals are willing to stay and willing to reproduce. Um, so it's, it's, an important, it's an important result that we'd like to see happen. I know maybe you don't want a vulture, that's not the point, but our songbirds are what we're talking about. So one of the things that I found, and again, please remember I'm not a landscaper, I'm not an excellent gardener, I'm a naturalist. My first degree is in wildlife management. And uh, so this comes from a perspective. My simplest way was I picked, pulled my survey map out. This is my home, my yard. This is uh, the, my... Houses, it sits on the property without any of the trees that were there. There were a few mature trees when I bought it. I've lived there 24 and a half years, and later you'll see the difference. There's a lot of white space on here, and there wasn't a lot of mature trees, which have now since grown, and I've added some, some native shrubs. So we'll, we'll get a chance to see that. But you want to look at those hardscapes. Show your current plan uh, and the potential spread right, of, of where those trees will go. You know how to do that when you see people draw those those uh, different base maps of your property. And evergreens are pretty important. They provide shelter year-round for wildlife, and that's one thing that if you don't have an evergreen, start thinking about what evergreens are native to your area and what would be on your wish list, and do you have a place for it? If not, then you can't do that, obviously. But if you can put something in your property that's that's some form of an evergreen, that would be fantastic. Deciduous trees generally provide the most food as well as shelter and native trees to the area. There was a study that found that 84% of the counties in the United States, uh, the oak trees are the most critical deciduous tree for the food chain. And we're talking about reconstructing the food chain here. We're talking about putting back what would have been there if we weren't, but getting to live with that and enjoy that at the same time. So your evergreens also can be a windbreak for your home if you have the space for them, and they can hold um, onto fruit, 
the, or shrubs can rather, can these shrubs can hold on to fruit and give them something to eat. It won't be their favorite if it's still there in the fall and you've got fruit hanging in the spring. It's not their favorite. The favorites are gone, but you may have birds that come in that they'll eat it, right, if they're, if they're hungry enough. But the, the shrubs provide that structure. Um, they can also provide some protection from hawks. I know a lot of you just lit up with, oh, those Cooper's hawks. Yeah, they've kind of uh, gone from almost a threatened species to a backyard um, consistent guest and they too have to eat and when you build your garden or design your garden to draw part of the food chain you're going to create the whole food chain and I know it's hard but hawks don't know you like those birds. Hawks don't understand that you have a favorite bird. Uh, and hawks don't understand that just because the cardinals read that we are very attracted to it to them it's just easier to find a red bird than a brown bird in the shrub, right? The shrubs will stop some of that and protect them to some degree. Native perennials uh, will be most adored by native pollinators. We need to consider mixing and matching our plants. We need to consider our native landscape because the insects that are, that are unbuilt, that we're trying to reconstruct this food chain, they haven't adapted to our cultivars. They need what they what they evolved with. I love my hostas because my hostas on the north side of my house make it look like I know how to garden, and my toads love them. And though though you may not like slugs, the slugs feed other things like the toads and the other small animals that eat them, and they all love that garden. And I do nothing except fence it off from the giant tortoise that walks through the yard. So consider natives when you can. When you lose a plant, does it have to be the same plant? Has the shade changed? Do you have more shade or more sun? Should you put something different? And please consider a native plant so that maybe we could get to um, a higher percentage of natives over our, our, our cultivar type plants. So food niches, the more niches you provide in your garden, the more species of birds can live there together. Think vertically. Um, there's a book and at the end of my presentation I just take photos of the book so you can see them and that's why there's just pictures of books at the end of your slide set. Um, George Adams did a book, Gardening for the Birds, which is what convinced me that people wanted to know about this because this is something I used to talk about all the time. So he put in his book to think vertically and I guess I've, I've always thought of that but never explained that to people. So I drew this of a how this is not my house. I don't live in a garage with a door in the front, although I love the thought of that size of a house. Um, a vertical view, and it's a little hard to read, but basically what you see are the different levels on the right of different plants in, that you could have in your yard up to the canopy. And then on the left, I have this list, and though it's hard to read, you're going to get hawks and swallows and siskins up in the top. You might get owls tucked in at that. The understory is a large space um, right under the canopy to clear down to the shrub level and a little bit overlapping with the shrubs. The woodpeckers love it up there, the nuthatches, the chickadees. You get a little lower and you'll get those flycatchers that are going in and out of those shrubs and they'll shake a shrub just to see what flies, right, and go out and grab the bug that flies out. Your cardinals and titmice, but you also have animals that want to be on the ground. You don't necessarily need ground cover because predators hide in things on the ground. You actually need open spaces for some of those ground uh, creatures, those ground birds. So top to bottom, air above your tree suits a swallow just fine for catching bugs as well. Dense upper tree helps birds like the Baltimore Oriole feed and, and nest privately. I don't know how many of you have seen Oriole nests, but very often they are sky high right in the underside of the canopy. The outer edges of the branches of the trees or shrubs are great for chickadees to see where they want to go next and to listen for loud noises. If a tree falls, the chickadees are the first ones there to see what bugs are coming out of the tree. It's amazing how, how accurate they are to finding a fallen tree. The trunk and its residents, uh, insects, are perfect for birds like nuthatches, little brown creepers, and woodpeckers. Those three little sets of species, I, we have two kinds of nuthatches, we have one little brown creeper, and in Illinois we have um, seven woodpeckers. They all get the vertical landscape. Nobody's fighting for food up and down the trunk, but that, they, so it's a pretty great, um, it'd be great to be one of those guys. They actually have zygodactyl toes, which means two in the front and two in the back. 
I think it's funny because I'm sitting here showing you and you can't see it with my hands. <laughs> so there's there's some different birds to consider. There's your zygodactyl toes, two in the front, picking a bug uh, or putting a seed in there to open up. Here's a titmouse, my absolute favorite songbird. They like to be on the ground. And the one on the right is the white-breasted nuthatch. We also have a red-breasted nuthatch. He also has zygodactyl uh, design to his feet. And those guys uh, are going to want to pick bugs and insects out of bark. Just fun to look at some of the species. In the middle, the cedar waxwings um, feed on fruits at the top of short trees and like your leftover uh, crab apples. They love those. They don't love them enough to eat them early, but as they migrate back through, they will clean out uh, a, a crab apple tree it's because they flock and there's a lot of them. So something to consider when you think nobody wants your crab apples, wait till spring. They'll also do that with service berries um, and such as anything that leaves berries on uh, choke cherry. Bluebirds will stay outside of those plants but wait for insects to fly out. And bluebirds are good insect eaters. They do a great ecological service for us. If you can house uh, and provide for a bluebird, they will get a lot of the insects that you don't care for uh, in the garden because you've drawn the insects and they eat them before they can damage your plants. Wrens will go in and out of shrubs looking for insects as well. These are two of my photos. I'm not a photographer and these are kind of, there's a close up on the right. The wax wings were literally swallowing the crab apples whole, and then their 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 crop or gizzard was full, and they'd sit there and, and somehow you know the muscles then would crush all that and they'd start over again. But to swallow that whole, it was absolutely amazing. Um, but those sat there all winter. These were spring and nothing touched them, but they obviously had a benefit. Here's a picture of a male eastern bluebird. In case you weren't sure, uh, I hope to do a bluebird program in the next year on eastern bluebirds because they are such a fascinating little creature and we almost lost them uh, because of the um, the starlings are really hard on them and uh, tend to, to to pick on them a little bit too much. On the floor, towhees, juncos, they'll scratch the ground below. Uh, hummingbirds hover, right, and they like those vertical uh, and flowing vines, things like that. And then robins and flickers pull worms. Flickers are one of our, it's our only woodpecker that prefers to feed on the ground and eat worms versus pecking into a tree. And uh, without going into great detail, they, their, their structure of their skull is such that it's made more for, um, for pulling worms instead of, instead of pecking into the hardwood of trees, which seems pretty smart to me. They also like dried fruit. Um, and if we get a hard snap in the spring and the robins are already here, a lot of people like to put out dried raisins, dried cranberries, but bring those in at night because other animals will come and enjoy those that you don't want. So... On the floor, there's uh, morning doves. The flicker's in the top corner there. It's He's working his way through my yard. I had some flickers born in my yard last year. I also had some downy woodpeckers for a second year. I'm finally getting a yard slash garden that's carrying that reproductive piece I was looking for after all these years. So they're just photo examples to enjoy today. So some design thoughts. You want to maximize um, those undisturbed areas if you have any, or sometimes you might have to create um, an undisturbed area because the birds don't always love perfection. Uh, concentrate uh, areas for people activity. Consider the ability to view your new guests. If you're going to feed the birds, don't make your garden such that when you get your feeders up, you can't see it from a spot in your house because it may be that we're having a snowstorm, but the birds are still feeding and you're going to want to be able to enjoy them. A lot of people ask me if they should feed the birds into the spring and summer. Um, I don't think financially it's a good idea. I think you should save your money and start up again in the fall. And it also, the birds in the spring have to feed their young insects. Uh, they cannot feed them seeds. It'll kill them. So if you can plant according to the need of the insects, that would be more a uh, more useful situation than feeding them seeds all summer. So consider that too. Um, preserve existing trees. You want structure. Uh, plant a new tree before you eliminate an old one. I had a, oh my goodness, it was a honeysuckle. My peers, I never let anybody in my yard that was a professional peer because I had this invasive shrub, but it was hard to explain that it was invasive and horrible to all the birds that sat in it all winter long for protection. And I finally planted four service berries in place. And as soon as they were big enough and producing fruit, 
uh, I disposed of that large shrub. Uh, and it was hard because it was there when I bought the house, and though it was invasive, it, the birds don't know that, right, in this case. So go see the real deal. If you're wondering what your yard should look like, if you have a prairie section, a forest section, if you have a damp corner in your yard, go visit your local parks or prairies or forest preserves and see what you like about that. And you won't be able to mimic a community in that large, but you might get ideas and, and see pieces that, that you might like. So your wish list. You're going to want to cross-reference your plant list um, if you want birds. And uh, those books at the end have some of those in there. So you're going to want to make a list of plant type, maybe uh, cross-reference it with um, species that you find attractive that you'd like to attract. You might find something, a uh, new bird that's in your area you've never seen. Keep it native to your area if you can when you are willing to do that because we're trying to draw the native insects that feed the baby birds in the spring. They will come and use your yard, but they will only reproduce if there's enough food to raise young. So make sure you have the plants that attract those insects for food. Try to have plants that flower throughout the season as well. That's something you all know that are gardeners. Uh, if you have a favorite bird, plan specifically for that bird. And something to think about, Doug, Dr. Talamay, um, did some research with Smithsonian. He is out in the University of Delaware, and they did the first study, and it was a, um, they studied the impact of non-native plants on the Carolina chickadee. It was the first study linking landscape decisions, garden and yard decisions, to the bird's breeding success. And they found that more than, they know that more than one-third of our bird species in the U.S. are insectivores. They require insects. And they found that the percentage, where everything drops off, that 70% is the threshold. We need 70% native plants and 30% non-native. This is trees, shrubs, and your, and your herbaceous type plants. We need 70% of our landscape to be native. And it dropped the reproduction rate of this Carolina chickadee, not our black cap chickadee. The Carolina chickadee dropped to zero once we once they went under in an area that was under 70% native. Um, it dropped to zero, and they found that a lot of the chickadee babies had died because there were so few native insects to feed those babies, and the babies were so hungry they ended up feeding them seeds anyway, and they died because they couldn't digest the seeds. So it really is research proven that this is important, that we try to make a difference in our in our gardens and yards for these animals, and then we get to enjoy them. It's a win-win. So make a thoughtful plan. Take the time to draw or have a professional draw your birdscape. I made that word up, by the way. Um, the, the bigger the plant, the more the cost. You know this. So what would you want to do for this year? If you don't have shrubs, if you have always wanted an evergreen, if there are native shrubs you'd like to try, this that's where I'd put my money first. I did a witch hazel three times. Thank you, rabbits. Um, but I, now I have my witch hazel. I've got it protected enough. My witch hazel and my red bud aren't that far away from each other. They should fill in and touch each other. But after reading the research out of U of I, um, Mike Ward's research out of the University of Illinois, our shrublin birds, some of my favorites, like our uh, our woodpeckers, our robins, they love that shrubby wall to go to, but the open space that is shared by dogs and entertainment space in my yard. Um, they love to have that shrubby wall to go to and that open space to go and look for worms. So by putting these native shrubs together and spending a, my, my money last year on the witch hazel for the third time, um, I now have this beginning along with some dogwoods that allowed that to happen. And maybe that's why the flicker reproduced uh, in, near my yard or in my yard. I couldn't find the nest. Something to consider. So you can fill in with some of the less expensive each year, but I would really go for what's your money piece each year? What could you add each year? And I know I've had a house for 25 years and wish I'd have done this from the beginning because my yard would be very fulfilled and very worthy of multiple species of birds right now. Had I done one big thing a year and then lots of little things of change uh, in my habitat of my yard. When you're not able to buy more plants, you know, prep your space. I was a, for years when I didn't have much money, um, my nephew called me a dirt farmer because all I did was kept beds weed free and mulched. There was nothing in them. And when it came time to plant, it was ready. They were ready and I didn't have a lot of trouble with, with seeds or with weeds. So how native? Mm, they say 
uh, if your plant species, according to George Adams, and then if you talk to other people, they may even say a little less or a little more, that your, if your plant that you're buying uh, was from within a certain distance, in this case uh, he put 100 miles, it will more likely survive. So a red bud from southern Illinois, where I went to school, if I brought it up to northern Illinois, it just may not um, acclimate well but uh, that's not something I've proven myself. Natives can be in a, in a natural garden or they can be more formal. I think the problem is a lot of people think native means a ratty, messy grassland. It's not. You can make a garden as formal as you want by choosing your plants wisely. Look for shape. Look for color. They're out there. And you could actually fulfill an entire garden in full natives. We planted a monarch way station in DeKalb County five years ago, shrubs and um, native perennials included, it's all native and it's beautiful. Um, and people don't realize until we tell them that they're all native because we purposely chose the color, the shape, the size. Uh, and it, and it, that hardiness is the last point that we were already talking about. My favorite thing is structure. I love structure. I like parts and pieces of bird baths. If I don't have the top, I put a gazing ball on it. If I only have the top and the bottoms broke, I put it on the ground and put water and stone for the for the butterflies. So think about the things that you can give them and places they can either live, hide, perch. All that is really necessary for those guys. Post clotheslines. I know a lot of people don't have clotheslines anymore. Um, I love my clothesline, and it also it's probably used as much by the birds as it is by my laundry. Here's just a picture of a young robin waiting for mom and dad, um, but it displays that need for perching. And young birds, especially in this case, they wait for their parents to go shopping and bring home food, and then they eat and they wait again. It's awfully similar to my just graduated son, I guess. Um, he perches in the living room and asks what's for dinner, right? So the, the other thing is a lot of the, we have shepherd's hooks, a lot of us, for holding plants and bird feeders. Those are good spots. This happens to be a hummingbird uh, that was born in my yard. I named her Bug. She was quite the um, character. She liked to show off. She liked to attract the cat. And she fell in love with Pin. Bug is now displaying for Pin, see her tail tip toward you to the left, and she would do all kinds of dances. And I actually have a picture of, of Bug asleep next to Pin. Um, so I never moved that clothespin all season because she, that was her buddy. And that became, you know, that's a physical material structure that's not normal, but she liked it so it stayed. I know many of you don't appreciate squirrels. I don't mind them in my yard, and so this is a display to show you, a picture to show you that it's kind of dark, but woodpeckers are a keystone. I call them a keystone species. Many, many birds and other wildlife require cavities to raise their young or some form of a cavity nest. White-breasted nuthatches, chickadees love cavities. Screech owls love cavities. Those birds can't make a hole. Our woodpeckers don't tend to use the same hole twice. They tend to make a new one, even if it's right below or above the old one. So that opens up the possibility for a hole for another animal to reside. And so when you start seeing that transition, and that's what my downy woodpecker did, he made a new hole this year from the one last year, and a nuthatch moved in to the one. They had this whole condo thing going. And that wouldn't have happened without that woodpecker pecking that hole originally. So I think we also have to be more open-minded. Um, a lot of us feed the birds, and we want just the birds. Some people live in places where they can't, are not allowed to feed the birds anymore because it draws the mice, which is another part of the food chain. And if you have mice, you draw things like foxes and coyotes because they don't know you care. They don't know that you fed the birds that fed the mice that feed them. They're simply surviving. So we kind of have to give and take. I love everything uh, except when my dogs go out and there's a skunk. And that's about the only line that that gets crossed with me. Permanent feeding stations, we talked about this. Um, I don't stop till the insects are abundant for the adults. So the adults are, can eat seeds. Once the insects are abundant, I figure they've got enough to eat between. Because we stop feeding our birds sometimes in April, but there's nothing that's gone to seed yet for those adults who eat seeds. So, And if the insects aren't out, um, it's kind of makes it feel like you're doing what you're supposed to to, to help. Uh, but I, we have to remember, let's be honest, they lived for thousands, millions of years, whatever, um, without us 
feeding them. It's about us. It's about us getting to see them and feeling like we're doing something good uh, and protecting something. But if you keep a station year-round, you have to make sure you clean it, especially in the summer. It can get really contaminated. Birds have diseases, not that we get, but if they they could spread them to someone else, um, and that might uh, that might be a problem. Uh, but you're going to get other people. So here's <laughs> mixed with the nature center in my own home. The bottom picture, which is a 13 line ground squirrel. He was doing this Grinch thing. I was like, why is the mulch moving? And I looked again. He literally had his front legs dragging behind him, pushing with his hind legs, scouring for leftover bird seed. And I was cracking up because he totally thought he was completely hidden. And he almost was. Uh, but if you feed, you're going to get squirrels. Okay, you're going to get raccoons maybe if you live in a wooded area or a neighborhood that um, has been leaving their garbage unattended maybe or something. It, they're going to come. So you have to make a decision. Are you willing and able to deal with that? Do you have pets that could get into trouble? Are you willing to alter your pattern? I put only, my small dog only goes on, out on a leash right now because uh, at night or in the early morning because we have young owls that were born in our neighborhood. and young owls are hungry and they don't know the difference between a small pet. Everybody talks a lot about coyotes but quite frankly great horned owls are just as big of a threat to our pets um, as the coyotes are. I love them both. I get it. I, I understand why it would happen but we have to make adjustments to our own. We can't assume that that owl knows that that animal is our pet and they shouldn't touch it. They're hungry and their parents have stopped feeding them and they the parents aren't like us. They don't understand that love of whether they live or die so that that animal is strictly on its own so we have to be prepared remember the base map well look at it now this is why I have 13 line ground squirrels probably but the interesting thing here is it's grown in and some of it I've, I've gotten rid of some of the concrete there was a back sidewalk that went to nowhere so eventually over time I was able to get rid of that the trees have filled in to the point where I can't grow vegetables it's too shady in the back left corner there's kind of three small things in a row and it's a witch hazel a red bud and then over by the little box which is a barn an 8 by 10 little barn that's one of my um, dogwoods and there's four more dogwoods spread throughout my forest left side there but what I want to um, point out in the far right corner I wanted a wildlife garden and I started that because the robins kept nesting in this evergreen thing in the back corner so this next slide I took it to a person who knew what they were doing unlike me a landscape designer and that's the photo I showed her because I was killing it with tarps and black plastic and such and that's the drawing she came up with for me and I have most of it in place and or it's already lived and died and I'm switching it to all natives because at the time I wasn't doing all natives um, so I'm slowly switching it now to all natives but that long wall where the garage is now has a beautiful service berry that just just glows in the in the fall and there's uh, two ewes that provide a lot of cover um, there's a sergeant crab that I wait and watch the birds come in the spring they don't they don't strip it clean usually right now but they will come later but I just wanted to show you that even for somebody like myself that doesn't know anything about gardening and I told her I wanted it structurally landscape you know physical so there's a log that I actually put there and there's a pile of rocks for toads and small things to hide in and a winter over in so it was done with with wildlife in mind all right so the slides and that you should have a printout um, or ability to get to the printout and the, these will be in there this is the book I was telling you about it's not something I read verbatim but I this is the book that made me realize that people might be interested in gardening specifically for birds or thinking about it and it might make the idea of going native more digestible it's not that we want anyone to strip their yard of those favorite plants that you've purchased for their color or or such but the things we pick that are non-native usually weren't created to produce the right amount of pollen or the right amount of nectar they were produced for the human eye not wrong at all but how can we do an aim for that 70 30 70 native 30 the stuff we love I'm not giving up the hostas because they really do make me look like I know something 
So there's a book out there for fun, Projects for the Birders Garden. I've used this with my master gardeners. Um, think Cool things you can do in your garden. For those of us who have kind of an artistic side, want to see the structure and physical things that stay in the garden. The Native Plants in the Home Landscape is excellent as a, as a research guide from U of I. And it's a lovely book. And it's a good winter book when you're getting the winter blues in January and February to start looking at pictures and you haven't gotten the burpee or the ball seed catalog, right? Um, this one's really great for, for your eye. Bringing Nature Home was very popular. This is Dr. Talame that I told you about that did the research on the Carolina chickadee. Uh, he is a good writer. He's a good speaker. And if nobody can convince you, he can, that native is critical. Uh, they, he did it, one of the things in his book said something close to the, the box elder, who it's in the maple family, provides for six organisms. I want to say it was under 10. I think it was six. Whereas a bur oak provides for over 500 different organisms that need to be on our planet that sustain who we are as humans. And when we talked about the birds earlier, I told you that um, he had stated that that one third of our bird species um, require insects. And I think you may have heard from our, our amazing Hort team that, you know, without native pollinators, we lose a third of our food, like if every third bite is gone. And let me share with you from a science perspective, if we lose a third of our food chain, it really doesn't matter because we're in kind of a collapse mode. So somebody might say, well, I'll just eat something different. That's not the point of that. The point of that one third is that it's connected to that, that universal food chain. Um, and we need to be very aware of that. And I think gardeners can save the world. But, you know, that's me because we have so much of the property and we have so much of the ability to make these decisions and make the right decisions. Right. This one's fun if you want to learn more and kind of focus more on wildlife, um, creating habitats and homes for Illinois wildlife. It's a very good, um, a good book for that. So if you want to combine your gardening sense with your newfound wildlife and bird sense, this would be a good combo uh, book. I threw this one in here because I was talking to you about turkey vultures. This book focuses on the ecological services of wildlife. And though it might not all pertain directly to um, songbird species, I think you'll find it absolutely fascinating, the billions of dollars that we don't even understand um, are given to us just by the natural food chain when it's in perfect order and it's, and it's not being disturbed. So we're going to wrap things up, and we're going to, uh, in a moment, take your questions or any questions that came in. This, by, by the way, if you bird feed, I threw this in here, too, because notice the straw, the straws on the feeder. So I paid money for this feeder, and I got another one similar from the dollar store. The dollar store one was working beautifully, but birds other than a chickadees, nobody could feed at this feeder. And I realized that in trying to save money, I finally figured it out, that the perches were too short. Don't assume when you buy bird feeders to add to your structural part of your garden that they work. Turns out the birds couldn't, most of the birds couldn't stand on the perch and get their head in because they would have to go out too far. So uh, Culver's makes a straw that fit my perches perfectly. So those are Culver's straws. Now you know a little bit about where I might go eat if I have the opportunity. Um, and those Culver's straw, then I cut them longer and then everybody started feeding. So keep that in mind that not everybody knows what they're doing when they create things. Um, I wasn't going to leave this in. I'm glad it is. Something to, to really quickly talk about if it's, I don't know, I hope it's coming up there. It's the migratory path. So we talk about our birds eating. We talk about them traveling and migrating our, our cedar waxwings. Isotopes are found in the soil and they're fixed. Those fixed isotopes go into the plants. They go up the stem and into the leaves. A caterpillar will eat that leaf and that caterpillar now has that isotope from that soil. A bird comes along on its migratory path and eats that insect and now that isotope secures itself in the feather of that bird. Scientists are now able to track birds migratory path by soil type. They know where they were within uh, within very few miles based on so if a bird ate a certain caterpillar in Georgia 
the isotopes from the Georgia soil that went into the plant, that went into the caterpillar, now exists in the bird, and the bird does not have to be destroyed to find out its migratory path. And that, to me, is impressive. But if we don't have food for that migratory path and we don't have our food chain in order, that system won't happen. But we can find it now. We can, we can locate it. We can, <clears throat> we can test for it. So when this scarlet tanager, also known as the summer tanager, <laughs> it's a different bird. We were talking about this earlier, um, an identification issue. But this bird migrated. And you could, if you were the scientist studying those isotopes, be able to tell someone exactly where it came from and how far it came. And you might think that's not important, but in the case of how it impacts us as humans, I put this in there. If you think your yard is too small to make a difference, I do want you to think again, because little things can make a big impact. Feeding these insects and reconstructing our food chain. And this last slide, flight 1549 landed on the Hudson. So Scully, uh, Captain Scully landed this plane on the Hudson. Everyone survived because of three geese that went into the engines. The, the geese in New York at the airport know better, and they couldn't figure out why. All of a sudden, they flew into the engines. Well, they tested the feathers, and they located the isotopes. They were migratory geese out of Canada. They were not the geese that stay at the airport, and they were able to figure out why, that's, why that happened, but it only took three geese to make that impact. You can make a huge impact by aiming for that 70-30 in your yard and sustaining wildlife to the best of your ability. And I would appreciate it, and the birds would appreciate it. There are other things that you can do if you love birds. There's competitive birding. And believe me, it's competitive. You can participate in Christmas bird counts in your area. Uh, you can have a life list. I have a list just for my backyard because that's really all that's where I care to sit and watch. And I've had some pretty exciting visitors in my yard. You could practice falconry, which takes a long time. There's still duck stamps and bird banding. You can help. Um, you can help and do that as well. So thank you and uh, hope that this at least gives you something to think about through the winter and to um, enjoy the thought of. There's my information. There's my contact. Thank you, Hort Group. Uh, at the bottom is my email, <clears throat> and our main phone number for our office is there. And I'd be more than happy to talk about this with you at some point if you need me to, but we are going to have some time here um, for questions. And I